Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. And welcome to our quarter end, month end, first half of the year end of 23 podcast. Kevin, what's going it's on? Exciting year so far, Tom. Lots so, happening. Great start to the year. Equities are rallying way more than people broadly expected. Banks are starting to revise estimates higher. It's the no recession recession. All right, let's break it. Let's break it all down. We'll go over the numbers, see where we're at year to date with the first half of the year behind us. And then more importantly, we'll kind of give our thoughts on the second half of the year. What what we think uh, the markets are going to do, what to expect, where we see some opportunity, uh, where we are going to be a little bit cautious. And uh, we'll go from there. Bringing you a look at the past month and what may come, here's the latest financial update. So let's start with a high level. Markets up year to date. Um, depending on what market you look at, I mean, you got bonds that have made a little bit of a rebound up up a couple percent. Um, and then you got the NASDAQ that's up almost 35%. Yeah, so I think the easiest way to look at it is to start at the beginning of the year, what were expectations? And they were really bad. And the reason for that is that everybody said, oh, 22 is bad. Well, 23 will be bad, too. Haven't you heard about this recession? And stocks did what they always did, which is uh, whatever the least people expect to have happen, happens. So we've seen a major rally. We had the S&P up about 14% year to date. Uh, the Russell 2000 up about 6%. NASDAQ, I mean, <laughs> exponentially higher at 36.5%. Um, and we even got some performance out of some of the developed markets internationally up about 11%. So this is a major change from last year where the broad markets were down 20, the NASDAQ was getting crushed, the Russell 2000 was getting crushed, and it was on the backs of, well, higher interest rates, stocks can't make money, they can't do well, we're repricing, it's all going to be terrible, and there's a recession coming. Uh, I think that the stock market's a forward-looking machine. Uh, I think last year was pricing in any type of lower economic growth, whether it got to recession or not. Uh, and now it's not so much clear. We've had a banking crisis. We've had, you know, an almost a debt default. It's climbing a wall of worry and stocks do what they always do, which is they just go up seven out of 10 years. Most of the time, most days are positive, not negative. Uh, and we had a really tough year last year and those don't typically repeat back to back. Yeah. You know, it's, Stocks typically don't react to the same news twice. Last year was the year of rising interest rates, the Fed moving, uh, which carried into this year. But I think the markets kind of grow numb and callous to it. Which you know, tech to your point, last year was down 34 percent, and now it's up thirty three, thirty four percent. We still got a couple of days left in the month uh, before the official midway mark. But anything that it, it, it flip flopped, all the stuff that did somewhat well last year, and there wasn't much not doing so well this year and, and, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, what's interesting though, when you look under the hood and we talked about this last month and things have been getting a little bit better as far as breath, but you look at the S and P 500 up 14% year to date, you know, it's still a handful of stocks that have been, been driving that return. So if, if, if you're looking at your portfolio, or if you have individual stocks that aren't doing as well, well, the average return of the other 493 stocks in the S&P are up about one and a half, two percent year to date. So big, big delta still between the, the index and the average stock within those, within those indices. Yeah, I think that the other takeaway is that it doesn't feel as good to recover from losses as it does to hit new highs. If you go back to January 1st of 2022, which is about when the markets peaked, we're still down. I mean, the the Nasdaq's still down nine, SPY's down about nine, small caps are down 17 from that level. So if you were buying at last all-time highs, you're just not going to feel that good. It's it's going to take more to get to those all-time highs and everybody to feel the wealth effect and feel positive again. Right now, it just feels like recovering from losses. And even though year-to-date performance is good, year to 18 months is not so good, still negative. 
Yeah, and, and, and you're seeing it in, in, in the sector level. I mean, I think last year, the year finished where there was, I want to say, an 80% delta between the best performing sector and the worst, which was energy and tech. Um, that isn't as wide this year, but it's the same theme. I mean, tech is up 38% and energy is down almost 10 And we're only halfway through the year. So for annualizing those numbers, um, it gets even wider than it was it was last year. So to your point, depending on what you're buying or where you're buying it, um, things aren't as good as far as the individual sector level. It's you have your winners and you have your losers this year for sure. In fact, there's one, two, three, four, five sectors are actually negative for the year. Um, the other the other seven are, are up. Yeah, what's funny about that is that it's the exact opposite of 22. So energy's down, utilities are down. Uh, I think financials slightly down, uh, but the big winners are tech, which was the worst performer last year. Communication services, second best performer. Consumer discretionary, third best performer. All three of those had a terrible 2022. So one of the concepts I think that's important to remember is if you look at these indices, whether it's some of these sectors or the S&P 500, is there is the concept of reversion to the mean. Um, I know that it's been proven for the S&P 500, but one kind of the advanced maths of what we do as portfolio managers is anticipate that reversion to the mean. So something like a snapback, and you've seen this, what was it, the, the Dow dogs, where you buy the worst performers from last year, and suddenly they become the better performers the following year. This type of mean reversion is not unusual. Uh, this type of market of having narrow leadership is not unusual. Uh, it's it's completely normal stuff. This is just part of the experience. Yeah, I uh... I totally agree. And what's been what's been unusual about this year is that, as I was mentioning on the front end, the Fed has been continuing to raise rates throughout this year. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only time they just put they just paused for the first time in in over what, 14, 15 months uh, this this past this past uh, this past month, and tech is continuing to rally, which the whole. The catalyst behind tech doing so poorly last year was 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 higher interest rates. So, um, you know, speaking of which, we had a we had a pause for the first time in the in the Fed funds rate, and you know now the market is pointing to that they're going to hike again come July. Yeah, I think if you look at the overall bond market, it's uh, slightly positive. If you use just U.S. Treasuries as kind of your your metric, long bonds. So if you're using TLT or IEF, which is intermediate. Those are up a small percentage for year to date. Even the, the SHY, the short term treasuries, they're up slightly. Uh, it seems that most of that interest rate rise got priced in last year as well. And we're kind of calming down. Uh, I also think it's a big difference from going from zero to 5% than from five to maybe 6%. The impact of that, the velocity, the pain you're going to feel from those rises is way different. And they've been much clearer with the communication. If you remember last March, I think is when they first raised rates. So this is about 16 months ago. They were like, ah, maybe we'll do one this year. We'll see. And then what was it 11, 12, 13 in a row? They raised at least a quarter point and they were doing 50 basis point increases at one point as well. So slowing that pace, um, I think it's just proof that expectations matter more than reality. When they expected a couple rate increases and it ended up being four or five percent, that hurts a lot. Uh, when it's a couple left, yeah, it's not so big of a deal. Yeah, you know, the speaking of expectations versus what the FMOC has as the year end estimates, this is the closest I've seen the market almost in line with uh, what the the Fed committee is projecting at five point six. So. The Fed's saying two more rate hikes between now and year end. You know, j remember, just in March or was it April when we went through that banking crisis, they were saying two rate cuts by the end of the year. Now they're saying two rate, two more rate hikes to get to five point six. The market's pricing in five point two. I, I still have my money on the market over the the Fed, but you know, two more hikes could be painful between between now and the end of the year. And um, something to stop this rally might be. Might be, I, I think a big part of this rally too is that everyone felt the Fed was getting a little long in the tooth, that the, the hiking cycle was going to come to an end. It's been priced in. If we get a 180 and they continue to hike and hike more than we, more than everyone anticipated, that that's where this thesis or where your 5,000 call on the S and P by by year end, which by the way you're halfway there. Halfway there. Could, could, <laughs> Midpoint. Could, let's go. Find me one other person in America that said that and. You know, I all I saw is negativity. Oh, Just, Tom you know, Lee. Tom to be Lee's contrarian. been 
Tom Lewis. Oh, is he positive? If, yeah, he's been saying it for like three years. Eventually, he's going to get it right. Broken clock, um, right? Well, hopefully, <laughs> three years from now, I'm at least beyond right. But I think that's the other thing. If you're a long term investor, you, you know, this is nice to follow. It's well, you know, worth keeping track of, and it's an interesting story. But you know, five thousand is great. But I would anticipate, Tom, you're a pretty young guy. We're going to hit ten thousand S and P in your lifetime. So if you're investing for that day, you know, you want to be long stocks. Now, it's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be pain along the way. But if you can stick it out, that's pretty good. I think the biggest loser this year is the VIX, down 36.5%, almost inversely correlated, correlated with the NASDAQ. Uh, for that to fall off a cliff, to have that volatility disappear, I think that's kind of a healing process for a lot of folks who felt a ton of pain in 2022, where it felt like every month the statement said, you lost money account was lower, the account was lower, and it didn't matter if you had bonds or stocks, both of them were going down. Uh, maybe if you had commodities, it did a little bit better, but that hasn't worked this year so well. Well, you know, speaking of the VIX, I mean, you had more, I mean, there are, it, last year broke so many records from a volatility standpoint. I mean, you had more, you had more days with 1% swings up and down than any other, any other year in the history of, of the VIX. You had more 3% weekly swings. You had, I mean, you, you name the statistic and number in terms of volatility. It was there last year. We had very few days where there was just a quiet or silent week or day. So, and that's completely flip-flopped to your point. Um, um, you know, what's interesting about the, the market right now is, you know, you look how quickly the NASDAQ has run up. In fact, do you know that year to date, this is the fourth highest the NASDAQ has ever been going into the first six <laughs> months of the year? <laughs> like like percentage are, wise or an per, actual per, number? No, okay. no, percentage wise. It's, it's the, oh, it ranks dot number boom four. Years. I'm surprised that we beat. <laughs> it ranks number four and it also did it with, um, it also did it with very few days, uh, you know, very few, very few positive days, which is really weird. So they basically saying the days that it was up, it was up quite a bit. Um, it wasn't just this steady increase of like a half a percent or 1% every day. It was these big swings and what you didn't get this year where the big swings down. Um, they just kind of ratcheted up. So that was pretty interesting. And looking at the second half of the year going back, I mean, the only years that beat it, um, you know, were... <laughs> Just a handful of years. I'm just guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're you're right. And the second half of the year performance was was pretty good. So we'll see if it can, if the rally can can last. But um, a lot of just just a lot of extremes the last couple of years on, on both sides. Yeah, let's before we move on to commodities and the dollar and other things, just to set expectations for the second half of the year in stocks. Uh, if you look at the forward earnings, which is what the professional is used to anticipate for stock prices, the Russell 2000 is trading at 24 times forward earnings. The S&P is trading at 19 times forward earnings. Now, I will carve that out and say that those mega cap stocks are trading at like 38 or 40 times earnings. And the rest of the S&P 500 is trading much lower than that. And then the NASDAQ, 36 times forward earnings. So I would say those are pretty lofty PE ratios. What do you think of those? No, they're, well, they are. I mean, there's no, it's not, I mean, it's not an opinion. I mean, they are what they are. I mean, they're, they're high. So the only way for the stock market to continue to go is through, uh, earnings and, you know, are we going to get continued earnings out of these companies? And uh, it's, it's hard to make that case because you have interest rates so high that it's a lagging indicator. Eventually, it eats it eats into your earnings, it eats into your cash flow. Whether you're a small business, mid business, large business, um, debt carry is real. It, it's mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for, in my opinion, for these companies to continue these earnings per share. Which, you know, that's the only way you can meet the level of returns, in my opinion, because I don't think you're going to get any more expansion out of um, the valuations. The multiple expansion, yeah. Yep. Usually that happens in anticipation of really high earnings per share growth, which is not expected, uh, or it's anticipating cuts in interest rates. Uh, so you get a higher PE ratio ahead of that because you're discounting those at a different rate. And that's not expected either. <laughs> so the only thing left in my mind that says, well, how is that possible? is inflation must be a lot higher than we realize. And I think 5% inflation makes those nominal numbers for earnings a lot higher than they actually are as far as like real growth. So if you have all the revenues for most of the major companies inflating at 5%, plus maybe they're growing at 3%, you might have some really you know big, big revenue jumps, uh, primarily from price inflation, not from them executing well. So 
you know, I, I don't see rate cuts. I don't see major earnings growth. It, it's got to be just inflationary, but it could also be uh, it needs to come down. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> sometimes I, I, simple explanation, right? Well, it's too you, high. It's got to come down. You're 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 not going to get the money to go into the market because what what didn't happen this time around. This is my big worry. What keeps me up at night is you never got capitulation last year. You never got. Uh, where the market halted and you had just everyone just got out of the market and went to cash. Everyone, the sentiment levels were there. You look at all the bears versus bulls. I mean, the highest level ever of people bearish and, uh, you know, not many bulls out there. People were talking the talk, but were not walking the walk. You still have all-time elevated positions in equities. You never got people going to cash or going to bonds like you saw in 2008. My point being is that, there's there's not a lot of money to chase back into equity because it's already there, and that's one that's one tailwind or catalyst is that when you have people in, in in elevated cash positions or in bonds and get back into the market, well, that naturally just um, will rise equity prices as more and more people chase the same amount of stocks. But that didn't happen this, this last time. Up. I'm really glad you brought that up because it's a perfect transition to talk about the role of the U.S. dollar. And in last year, in 2022. The S&P 500 was down 20 and the U.S. dollar was up about 20 percent. And you could say what drove markets uh, It was the strength of the dollar. Uh, this year, the dollar is flat minus one percent for year to date. And the market rallies. Uh, the market has a natural tendency to go up because the companies that are underlying them are out there every day trying to make money. So it makes sense, you know, just very logically. But if the dollar just calms down, stays flat or goes negative, that can be the other catalyst that rises things. So I don't think you need money off the sidelines for money market, which I do think there is a ton of that. I mean, was the last time money markets yield 5%? It was in the early 2000s, maybe mid 2000, like six, seven, like that last time we were at that level. So 15 years, people have said, I've had no alternative but stocks. And they go, I get 5% of money markets or treasuries or CDs. I'm taking some of the money out. So I do think there's a lot of supply to come on for cash, but if we just get the U.S. dollar to get weaker, which given our trade deficit and our national debt, like should get weaker, uh, I think stocks can go another leg up and hit that 5,000 mark. Yeah. I mean, you did have, I mean, at one point last year, there was almost a perfect, I think it was like 0.94 correlation to the dollar in the mm -hmm. S&P 500, which you don't see that kind of correlation usually ever. Um, but you're right. There's no, it's no coincidence that the dollar has lost steam and the market uh, tends to rally. You know, with the whole money market thing, everyone keeps talking about it and 5% and you can get CDs, but no, but you still don't have high positions in in cash and and in bonds, but I, I do agree with you. I think with the dollar with the dollar falling off, um, it's going to be it's definitely going to be a tailwind for uh, for equities. Yeah. So as far as stress in the market, the other way I would say is if you look at yield spread, so high yield over the ten year Treasury, there doesn't seem to be any stress in the market yet. Uh, there should be because they're borrowing in absolute terms at three or four percent higher rates than they were when they previously went to go market their debt. But there's no stress. So yields have just kind of moved up altogether. There hasn't been a you know point that says, well, high yields, you know, really exploding higher. These spreads are getting wider. That tends to be a kind of a, I don't know, canary in the coal mine uh, to say there's trouble in credit markets. So without any credit crunch, despite higher yields, I mean, Maybe Royal Caribbean, <laughs> bad example to use a specific stock, but a lot of those kind of not so well run companies that have a ton of debt that they need to refinance, they're going to be refinancing higher rates. That should crimp their style at some point. But um, yeah, speaking of credit markets, you're right. The the spreads and basically what what spreads are in the credit market, your what's considered your risk free rate of return is, is is Treasuries. So Treasuries is backed by the government, so you get your your interest and um, your money's good. Anything, any spread above those interest rates is issued to corporations because you're taking on more desks, taking on more risk, such as default risk. So when spreads widen, it means you're taking a lot of risk in the bond market. There's chances of these companies defaulting, et cetera, like you had in 2008. Um, you're not seeing that. However, what you are seeing is you're seeing credit default swaps, the insurance against that happening, spike through the roof on uh, on sovereign debt almost across the world right now. Um, so you think similar, that's where the trouble is? I like I that. I think that, Don't I think that say more, <laughs> it, it could be, it could be the calm before the, before the storm. Um, you know, it's, it, you're, I mean, you saw it with, with credit Swiss. I mean, and look what happened with them. So you have all these big institutionals that are buying credit default swaps, which is 
credit default swaps, which is just insurance betting on the fact that um, this debt doesn't default. And if it does, you make money on it, just like it happened in, in 2008 with the housing crisis. So that's a little bit alarming. And you're seeing it, you're seeing it at elevated levels like you saw in 2008. Um, I don't know. Do they know something that we don't, or is this just a pure hedge uh, in the event something does happen? Um, so uh, th there's a couple of things I think that are positive for the market that can keep this going besides the stuff we mentioned so far. The first one is that crude oil is down about 16% year to date, which we all fill up our cars with gas. If you have an electric car, you're using natural gas coming from a power plant, most likely, or coal. Having, we'll call it a commodity dividend by decreasing commodity prices, that's got to be good for stocks. That's got to be good for the consumer, right? Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree. I mean, um, you know, it's a big big part of big part of inflation. I mean, think about the average person too. You know, what they spend commuting to work, and I mean, this whole world revolves around you know the price of oil and, and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the number one, number two commodity on earth for sure. Uh, I think that helps, and I think that being down sixteen percent also is in line for weaker economic growth domestically as well as globally. So it's not a surprise that commodities would leave that kind of down. It doesn't mean the world's coming to an end. In fact, it can be pretty helpful. If you see commodity prices rising, that's usually kind of the end of the economic cycle. So having that decrease, I think it's helpful. Uh, the other detail is maybe the Ukraine war ends. Maybe, you know, all those Western governments that you mentioned have credit default swaps, maybe the U.S. government stops sending tens or hundreds of billions of dollars over there, and that just ends. And that could help with even more commodity prices when it comes to agriculture uh, and then all the resources being used in an actual war as well. So there's some positive possible tailwinds. I, you know, that war could go on for 20 more years too. But uh, if that were to end, I think that's a positive catalyst as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to have some major correction or, or deep recession um, unless there's something out there structurally like we don't know about like why people are loading up on these credit default swaps for something catastrophic to, to happen or take place outside of something out of left field i don't think the markets can continue to run like it has either to your point the valuations are, are way too high but what's also interesting is the is is the wage is, is our, our, our the unemployment rate and that's what the fed's so fixated on and you know it's hard to get a recession when you have under four percent, um, you know, unemployment. So I don't know. I think there's I think there's more tailwinds than than headwinds. Um, but I don't think we're out of the woods out of the woods just yet. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to finish with we talked about sectors, talked about major indices. The other thing that you know gets commented about was more popular when market had a little more dispersion was factors. So factors like quality, volatility, momentum, uh, dividend yield. You know, year to date, growth has been a good factor. Or that's more of a style, but quality's up over 20%. Volatility, sorry, minimum volatility, so low vol stocks, uh, that's up about 10%. Momentum stocks still have not quite gotten their <laughs> legs back. They're still down for the year. And high dividend yielders, uh, still not positive on the year. So, uh, you know, these momentum things, they, uh, they've worked well over 10 years. The other factors that have worked is quality and minimum volatility. They haven't worked as well as the S&P 500 has. Uh, I think there's value here. I just not really sure how to execute. All right, so let's um, let's let's end with a couple uh, predictions between now and year end. Get your future freezing cold takes as we launch into our latest series of bold predictions. And so, looking at the equity market, do you think that this is going to be a continued trend of of last year, meaning that the the sectors that are doing well year to date are going to continue to do well year to date, or is there going to be a reversion back to the mean to the sectors that have lagged? Yeah, I think over the next two months we'll continue to go higher. Uh, those same winners will probably either go sideways or a little bit higher. Some of the ones that haven't participated think we'll participate, and I think the place where we really have a lot of resistance is when the S and P gets to about forty eight hundred back to those all-time highs and everybody looks around and says, ah, things aren't that good. I think that's where you get the resistance. So I think it'll be tough to get to 5,000. I think it can happen. Uh, I don't know about rate cuts or any of that stuff, but I'm going to stick with my original January prediction and say we're going to get there by the end of the year. 
Yeah, I think I think the opportunity is is in the laggers this year. I don't think you can have companies like Nvidia that's up three hundred percent year to date, and some of these mega cap tech just because they've mentioned AI and earnings calls continue to to run. So I'm favoring the sectors that have better valuations. You know, the cyclicals, financials, energy. Um, I think you'll see a reversion back to the mean, and those will be the better performers between now and and year end. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the stuff in housing is good, like home builders doing well. That's a good sign, right? That's economic growth. That is a big chunk of the economy. If those keep going, I think you can probably hang on. And You know, inflation hasn't gone away. Wage growth hasn't gone away. People are, people are all right. Yeah, I, I think so, too. So uh, last, last question, over, under on rate hikes between now and the end of the year. Uh, at Where two. we set this line. <laughs> well, I'll take the over. Take the I'll over, take over too. more yeah. than two rate hikes. Yeah. First of all, the Fed doesn't know what they're going to do. So yeah. that, that's number one. So predicting this is hilarious because the people who we're predicting about don't have any idea what they're going to do. But I think that the problem is what we talked about in previous podcasts is unless they say, hey, we got inflation down to 4% and declare victory, they have to keep going. God, I hope it's not. Over if you're going to get to two, I'm, you got to keep going. I'm going to say it's, I'm going to go with what the market's predicting. And I'm going to say you're one more. Even money. I, <laughs> I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna. I think there's one more hike. I think it's gonna happen in July. I think the market's gonna not respond favorably to that, and then I think they're gonna pause between now and the end of the year with the potential with a potential cut in December. All right. Well, I will finish by saying, don't forget about Nikki T's book, the uh, Trillion Dollar Triage, which was all about the Fed. And he said, we keep a picture up of Arthur Burns in the Fed. They walk by it every time and go. Don't be Arthur Burns. So they're going to raise rates until they beat inflation. That is what my final bold prediction is. Oh, God. Well, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, well, on that, we will be back uh, in a couple weeks with our mid-month podcast. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tom. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.